This video is sponsored by Skillshare. This is the fifth in a series of videos about Simplex, a solid rocket motor that I designed, built, and fired earlier this year. Today, we're talking about the test stand that we fired it in, so let's get started. At this point, we've built just about the whole motor, and now it's time to put it together and fire it. We could totally just dig a hole, shove this thing in there, light the fuse, and run, but that's not the point of what we're doing here. If you'll remember, I'm working toward a space shot, and this motor development program is to help me learn and grow toward a space shot level rocket motor. And we can learn a whole lot more if we put this thing on a test stand and measure as much as we can. I opted to build it out of 1515 aluminum T-slot extrusion. I've used T-slot extrusions on this channel before, and and I love this stuff. It is like basically Legos for engineers. With any approach to building a test stand, you're going to have benefits and drawbacks. The chance that I Kato a motor, that is to say that I rapidly disassemble a motor without scheduling it, is pretty high. Aluminum has a relatively low melting temperature compared with steel, which means that if a hot jet of gas hits it, it's going to start falling apart. As a benefit though, aluminum is a non-sparking metal, which is helpful to have around solid motors, and come on, I mean, the T-slot extrusion looks awesome. The base is held together in a slightly rectangular setup with one foot segments, and I made a mirror image section to go on the top of the stand. In between are four foot long extrusions at each corner, and once the whole stand is put together, it's quite rigid. On one side of the four foot segments, I used the horizontal bandsaw to chop up and mount a section of triple slot extrusion, and this is where we'll mount the electronics later. For the central base of the test stand, I used the rest of that triple slot extrusion. I found a bolt size slightly larger than the internal holes in the center, and I tapped those. Then I drilled out the equivalent holes through the side of the base and anchored that in using six large hex bolts. As far as rocket motors go, Simplex isn't crazy powerful, but the Space Shot stuff will be, so we want really solid connections here. The motor is going to sit in the center of the stand, firing up, and we need a way to keep it from leaning side to side inside the stand. I chopped up four quarter 20 threaded rods and then drilled and tapped holes at the center of each of the top beams. At one end, I tossed a coupling nut with a ton of RTV all over it to give it a soft point of contact on the motor case so we don't dig into it. I then threaded those into the beams at the top and tossed a little RTV at the end to prevent the sharp end from scratching anything. An added benefit with this type of approach at the top is that I can fire motors of a bunch of different diameters. If we eventually move up to an eight inch diameter motor, that'll fit in this, or if we have to go down to a three or four inch motor, that'll work too. Now let's go back to the base. Between the test stand and the rocket motor, we want to place a load cell, which is how we're going to measure the thrust. Side note, because we're firing this motor vertically, that means that as the propellant mass leaves the motor during the burn, we're going to have to account for that mass loss in the thrust curve, but like, these are all very solvable problems. For the eventual space shot motor, our maximum thrust is going to be about 15 kilonewtons, or about 1.5 tons. So let's spec out to a load cell with a capacity for two tons. Here's how that went. Late one night, I was online shopping for load cells when I saw it. The prettiest girl at the ball. She was everything I was looking for. Robust, capable, and the shipping was cheap, so in a rush of excitement, I clicked order, knowing I had just made the right decision. Only, when this thing showed up, I realized that I had not, in fact, ordered a two-ton load cell but instead had ordered a 20-ton load cell. That's right. 200 kilonewtons, 200,000 newtons of capacity. <laughs> Just for reference, the Electron rocket from Rocket Lab has a first stage with a total thrust of 224 kilonewtons, just barely outside of the range of this thing. A Firefly Reaver engine gets up to about 184 kilonewtons, so we could definitely test a Reaver with this, and Astra's Rocket 3 gets up to 145 kilonewtons, so we could definitely test one of those stages provided, you know, 
it's firing along the correct axis. The fix here was fairly simple, although this is way more capability than we actually need. It is kind of fun to think about like, maybe one day I'll grow into the need for one of these massive load cells. And until then, I also have a three ton load cell. So what we're gonna do on this test stand is stack these two on top of each other and measure from both of them. Anyway, let me show you how that works by hopping into Onshape here. So our thrust take up structure has a few parts. We have these two load cells now, one of them wildly more capable than the other. We'll stack them on top of each other so we can do a fun little comparison when the motor fires. Then we need an adapter for the base of the stand, which I'll model here, and an adapter between simplex and the top load cell. These parts are relatively overkill, but so are lots of the things that I build. So let's make them. First, let's tackle the base. This part is getting made out of a huge chunk of aluminum 6061 stock material, which we're going to mill down on the Tormach. Now, this is a big part. We probably want some really serious work holding to keep this in... Oh, what? Sorry, what's that? Oh, you think we should use blue tape? Great idea. Let's just put it on with blue painter's tape. I milled this out on my Tormach 440 using a 3D adaptive tool path with a shallow radial path to finish it off. Also, the mist coolant was causing some problems with my blue tape, so I had to toss a fan on there to keep the part from getting too hot. I spot drilled the location of the bolt holes on the bottom, and then I drilled those out on my drill press. I knocked off the bottom on my little eBay lathe and the part came out great. So I mounted it on the center section of the aluminum extrusion and now it is time to move on to the next part. Next up is the adapter between the two load cells and this one is a piece of cake. I started with a two inch rod of stock aluminum then turned down both sides to their proper dimensions. I also ended up hitting the part with some aluminum polish and it came out looking pretty great. Big fan of polishing parts like this. Last in the thrust take up structure is the adapter between the top load cell and simplex. We're gonna mill this out of another massive chunk of 6061 aluminum stock material and we're gonna mount it to the mill using blue. Oh, what'd you say? Wait, hold on, what'd you say? Oh, you're really mad that I keep using blue tape and you think it's inappropriate for me to be showcasing this work holding strategy? No, it's, no, it's fine. It's, it's honestly, it's fine. I'm not mad, I guess I'm just, um, I guess I'm just disappointed. Uh, but it's, it's fine, I'll use the, I'll use the toe clamps. I started by milling out the bottom of the part using, you guessed it, a 3D adaptive tool path and the finishing path of, you guessed it, radial baby! I'm a huge fan of using the radial tool path to finish a part even though sometimes it looks a little funky around the edges. After this, I flipped the part over being careful to center it fairly well and did a, say it with me, 3D adaptive tool path with a radial finishing pass. I then turned down the groove we needed to seat the part inside the motor case using the lathe and I gave it a quick ring check. These parts are really overkill, but taking pride in your work is important. And I run a YouTube channel, so making stuff look pretty is like a big consideration. The final mechanic thing I wanna cover about the test stand is these bolts sticking out on top. I use these to tie down the stand at all four corners. The motor is firing down, but if our thrust is a little bit off axis, these will protect us. And in thinking of failure scenarios, if we have a burn through on the case with hot gas shooting out, we want a way that we can hold the stand upright. That's also the reason that these tie downs are metal rope instead of ratchet straps. If a chunk of APCP gets ejected and hits one of the tie downs, that metal rope will fare much better than a nylon ratchet strap. Okay, so that is the physical construction of the test stand. And now let's spin up some electronics. We're gonna start off with an old AVA board that has a GPS chip missing on it. So this board was like never gonna fly anyway. I spun up a little mount to attach this board to the stand using Onshape, and I actually created like a scary number of parts and mounts for everything here. This is kind of a testament to how much I enjoy using Onshape because I got really carried away making stuff. There's a lot of little bits and bobs in here that we're gonna get to shortly. First off though, let's get the circuitry done to measure pressure from those pressure transducers, and we're gonna put all these little components on a proto board. I got a nice 16-bit analog to digital converter and three 250-ohm extreme high tolerance resistors. We use these resistors in combination with the ADC because the pressure transducers I'm using actually read out pressure as current rather than voltage. So we use a current loop circuit to measure the voltage between the lead before and after it goes into the 250 ohm resistor. Next up on our sensor board, I added two HX711 load cell amplifiers, one for each of these load cells. These are all right for the task. They aren't super high quality, but this is the Joey B. Joseph Bislington space program and quality is not first on the list of priorities. 
Lastly, I'm gonna add three MOSFETs here and their associated pull-down resistors so that we can drive three high current LED loops. The Joseph Bislington Space Program's first priority is in fact LEDs. All these sensors get connectors wired up and labeled on them so we can easily detach this board for modifications down the road. And I labeled everything. I finally got a label maker and I'd wanted one for a long time, so I really went to town here. Now, while I start wiring all these things up on the test stand, let me tell you about safety and arming. When you've got an igniter inside of a rocket motor, you want to be unbelievably conscious of where those ignition leads are and what the current path could be to fire that igniter. Especially for a home-built or experimental motor like Simplex, we want to be even more conscious and make sure that Ava can't just go rogue and fire the motor while I'm right next to it. That's why I came up with this little doodad here, which lets us do remote arming for the test stand. This toggle switch physically bridges the gap between all of Ava's pyro channels and the igniter inside the motor, which means that when I connect the leads and walk around the test stand, so long as that switch isn't flipped, I'm still totally safe. The stand only becomes electrically armed once I send the command to rotate that servo, which flips the switch, which bridges the continuity gap, which sends a few microamps through the igniter to confirm connection, which finally lets us fire the motor. This little guy, along with Ava, a battery mount, a 24 volt boost converter, the sensor board, a 900 megahertz telemetry radio, and a whole bunch of LEDs gets mounted to the stand, so the whole system is mounted in one place. The upside of this means transportation and setting this thing up is super easy because it's all one package. I never need to worry about bringing separate parts and using Ava to fire the motor means we're doing flight-like testing since Ava will be firing that second stage motor on our space shot. The downside here is that if a rocket motor has a bad day, it's kind of likely that the electronics will also have a bad day. There's a lot of metal in between the electronics and the motor. There's just not a lot of distance. I'll even put this on the record. I'm glad that I built this test stand. I think it looks nice and it was a good exercise, but I think that eventually one of these motors is gonna blow up. And if it does, I think I'm gonna need to build a new test stand. Regardless though, back to wiring. I used these very bright LEDs, which I put in little 3D printed mounts in the hopes that if we ever do a test at dusk, it'll look absolutely incredible. I ran all the cables down to the electronics section in the same method as the sensor board with easy disconnections at either end. I did this because down the road when we fire larger motors, I may want to extend the length of the test stand and having easy cable disconnects will make that process a lot less painful. As I mentioned before, this radio works on 900 megahertz and it's the same type of radio that I use for most of my rockets these days. It's an RFD 900. I had a little bit of trouble getting all of my electronics to play nice together. Specifically, the radio and that 24 volt boost converter did not like each other, but once I sorted out the gremlins, I headed outside to get some beauty shots. pleased with this remote arming system and it gives me a lot more confidence in feeling safe when it's time to hook up the ignition leads for the motor. You might also notice a few extra bits and bobs of wiring. We ended up breaking out a separate 5 volt supply line on a linear regulator to the telemetry radio. The RFD900 is pretty sensitive to voltage spikes and the voltage booster down there was really messing with Ava's buck converter which would occasionally send a voltage spike into the radio which tells me that Ava's power management structure needs like a little bit of work. Either way, that just about covers it for this video. In the next video, we're going to talk about hydrostatic testing, why it's important, and how I pulled an incredibly stuck nozzle out of that case like the Hulk. I'm excited to finish up this series of videos soon, and I'm really glad that I'm not the only one who finds this stuff interesting, so I've been having a blast making these videos. If you're interested in supporting this project and you wanna watch way more content, that is available on the BPS Patreon. I made a video like once every two weeks while building this motor and it showcases the whole process chronologically pretty well. And that is a great segue into the sponsor for today's video. Oh, hey, what's up? Um, I don't know how you got back here, but I guess if you're here, you wanna see what I'm reading? It's, um, it's all about today's sponsor.
Skillshare. If you aren't already aware, Skillshare is a platform that helps you grow your skills and capabilities. You might know them from classes in photography, art, or video editing. I personally use a lot of Adobe Premiere and After Effects in my videos, and they have a pretty sweet class on 3D camera tracking that I quite like. But Skillshare is much more than that now. Here, let me give you a little excerpt. So Skillshare has hundreds of career-focused classes as well, and they've even got one in here on building a creative career, which honestly would have helped me a ton back when I was filming wedding videos or just starting BPS. They've got one in here on productivity and time management, which wouldn't have just been helpful back then, it would be helpful today. Also, just so we're super clear, this is a fake book. Skillshare is an online learning platform, and this is a book about systems engineering. There's a link in the description down below that I'm gonna tell you about in a sec, but just so we're super clear, this is a, this is a little bit, this is a little joke. Making changes and taking control of your career doesn't have to happen all at once. You can take it step by step, so there are simple courses like the productivity tips or more complex things like marketing your brand and business. You can join Skillshare today and the first 1,000 people to use the link in the description down below will get a free one month of Skillshare. I really enjoy working with brands that align well with this channel and if you're anything like me, if you're self-taught, Skillshare is probably up your alley. Thank you very much to Skillshare for sponsoring today's video. Thanks to you for watching it. My name is Joe Barnard. May your skies be blue and your winds be low.